Hi everyone, welcome back. So this is the final session of the virtual event today. So for all of those who are watching virtually, thank you so much for sticking with us and uh, putting forward all your fantastic questions. And uh, so we're going to start the um, next session, which is hydrogen for transport. And I am pleased to welcome Pablo Sebrian from CNH Industrial. And um, Pablo is joining us virtually. So welcome, Pablo. Great to have you today. And uh, Pablo is going to just start his session just in a moment. So over to you, Pablo, when you're ready. All right, I'm good then. So my, my pleasure to be here, okay? Thanks very much for the invite. And uh, good afternoon to everybody physically present in London and uh, virtually connected online. Uh, I'm head of global track platforms in Iveco, um, and especially involved with the uh, product development and business development when it comes to zero emission vehicles, okay, in, in specifically zero emission trucks. And this is what I would like to talk about. And I'd like to talk about the role of hydrogen in decarbonizing transport and specifically road heavy duty transport, okay. And um, the starting point is. Uh, why is transport important when it comes to CO2 targets, okay? And the uh, estimates, they differ from one place to another, and they're difficult because numbers are normally aggregated. But we normally say that transportation in general is responsible for 25% of CO2 footprint in Europe today. And half of that, maybe closer to 15%, could be due to road transport. And if we specifically talk about heavy trucks, then we'd be talking about 7%, impact on the CO2 footprint yearly in Europe, okay? Now, heavy trucks, when I talk about heavy trucks, we mean trucks that have a maximum mass above 16 ton, normally from 16 to 44 ton. And these are the big trucks that you see all around you, and they are used for a variety of missions today. We've been developing, it's a working tool that we've been developing for almost a century now, to serve a variety of missions from refuse collection in cities to door by door uh, transportation, regional distribution, long haul transportation, international missions, uh, all kinds of situations in which a truck is needed. Okay, they're very different. The truck form, the platform that we use for trucking is, is normally common. The drive line is reasonably common, but the tool itself, the truck, they're very different. Okay, if you come to a trucking factory, you will see that. No two trucks look alike. They're all different. Repeatability in manufacturing is very low. This is it's relevant for the discussion that we are about to have because we have a common target that is very demanding to decarbonize the world, to decarbonize Europe by 2050, to decarbonize transportation uh, at a very fast pace. And we are going to need different solutions to achieve that target. Okay, and it's becoming clearer and clearer that just like petrol and diesel have coexisted for 100 years almost, and they have served different situations, the same will happen with battery power vehicles and hydrogen power vehicles. They will coexist. There is a specific mission when we are talking about trucking, okay, because truck requirements, they're a bit different than the passenger cars or many other requirements, even light commercial vehicles, van requirements, they're different. No, uh, a heavy truck usually lives for 10 years minimum, sometimes longer, it has three lives. It's normally sold for the first time for five years and then bought back and resold again, and sometimes sold again in a different region or country, you know? And the uh, normal requirements are between 1 million, 1.5 million kilometers life for truck and components, okay? With no significant impact on performance. It'll look older, but it'll work just the same, okay? Reliability has always been a primary target for the industry. And uh, the, the missions, as I was saying, they vary very much. But when we discuss the long haul mission, that's relevant for CO2 emissions because it gives us more or less 70% of the CO2 impact of the heavy trucking, okay? And it accounts for 50% the sales in volume. More or less 300,000 trucks are sold every year in Europe today. Europe plus the UK, okay? Um, 300,000 trucks. Half of these 160,000 are trucks intended for long hauling. Now long hauling, what is it? These are missions where a driver drives 500 to 800 kilometers per day, typically in two stretches of four hours with a 45 minute break. And they amount to 120, 150, sometimes 150,000 kilometers per year, okay? Um, it, this specific mission, it has three requirements that make 
hydrogen, the ideal candidate to replace diesel, okay? The first one is payload. So a typical truck loaded will weigh somewhere close to 38, 40 ton, 44 ton is the maximum legal limit in most European countries. And as such, it will have 25 tons of payload. So that means that the weight of the truck when unladen is a very important indicator of whether the truck is fit for a mission because you want to load it as much as possible. Actually, one of the initiatives that are taking place to reduce the CO2 footprint is optimizing load and making sure that trucks are loaded on the way back and forth and they are fully loaded, okay? Which is complicating routes and making some things more difficult. The second requirement is refueling time, no? Everybody has seen a truck by us in a, in a fuel station. They require a different type of, uh, of station and it will take more or less one minute to fill 100 kilometers worth of diesel, okay? But a truck can have a thousand liters on board, 3,000, 3,500 kilometer range on board, a diesel truck. Can go back and forth sometimes just refueling once. So, uh, that's an important requirement. Now, the flexibility to refuel anywhere fast enough so that you can fill up your truck for 500 kilometers in five minutes, okay? That, that is actually something that will be the source of a lot of discussion, both for battery electrical and hydrogen trucks, because it's going to be determinant in how you adapt the trucks to the current routes. And then the third requirement is range, how long you can go without refueling, okay? Now, hydrogen is, nowhere close where diesel is today, due to the fact that hydrogen is a very energy dense molecule, but it's very light. So you need to compress it to 700 bar, or you need to liquefy it in order to have it on board with enough capacity to do 800, 900 kilometers, a thousand kilometers is already a very demanding target for a fuel cell truck or a hydrogen in internal combustion engine powered truck, both. Um, this is not the case for diesel, no? but it's very much so the case for batteries where you would need twice the way to achieve half the range. So already ranges of 300, 400 kilometers with a battery electrical vehicle are difficult to achieve today and they require a lot of space and more than space, a lot of weight. Also hydrogen requires a lot of space. And this is something that for the specific long haul mission and with the adoption of the new regulations coming into place regarding masses and dimensions can partially be bypassed with the dimensions of the car to accommodate some hydrogen tanks. And so this is giving us more or less what the situation is gonna be in the next years to come, a solution of battery electrical vehicles that will serve some missions like municipality, like urban distribution, like regional short range distribution, and long haul trucks that will eventually be replaced by hydrogen powered trucks. And both solutions are needed. They're complementary because hydrogen tanks, unless you choose an internal combustion engine, which is also a possibility, they're also electrical trucks. It's just that the source of electricity is the fuel cell. And, uh, and they're very much needed. And why are they so needed? Because we have a, a very challenging target to achieve CO2 parity by 2050 in Europe, okay? Now, that 2050 target has been broken down into immediate steps, so we could all understand them. No? And then the first one is a 15% reduction of CO2 emissions per fleet compared with the 2019 baseline by 2025, which is a number, it doesn't sound so much. No, I, the first time we saw this number, it, it does, didn't sound like that much. It's just that the industry has spent the last 20 years and Bosch knows this better than anybody else, trying to achieve local emission targets, the different European standards, Euro one, two, three, four, and two, six, where we are today, step B, uh, to achieve almost virtually zero local emissions, okay? Uh, at the cost of increasing consumption, losing efficiency and increasing cost and increasing complexity and trying to offset that loss in complexity and fuel consumption. So that has always been the game for the last 20 years. How can we do things in a way that it won't compromise the business or it won't increase fuel consumption? And as a token, we have today an after treatment system in a truck that weighs 200 kilos and it has over 15 sensors as opposed to one 15 years ago that was merely a tube that muffled the sound. And that's just one of very many examples, no? So 15% is actually a mind blowing target to achieve in very little time. And we need every tool available today as per the state of the art of the technology to achieve that target. And um, 
better dynamics, predictive uh, driving functionality, much better efficiency in terms of uh, driveline. But even so, even if we are able to achieve this target as an industry, we will still need to sell and register vehicles that emit zero emissions by 2025. Partial solutions, they help. Hybrids, smile hybrids, 7% to 20% hybrids. But fully electrical and fully fuel cell vehicles, they will be needed. And if we think about the 300,000, we'll be talking about 30,000 vehicles registered by 2025 to avoid penalties. Now, 2030 is a different matter, and we'll be adding another 15% on top of that. And that 15%, that is already, again, a target that we can get nowhere close to without heavily introducing into the market zero emission vehicles. And then here estimates are closer to 20% of the total industry volume being zero emission vehicles. Um, it's, it's a target that is actually being discussed because a much more important target is taking place now and uh, saying that we should be able to contain temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2030. And that target is not compatible with an only 30% decrease of CO2 emissions by 2030. It's much more compatible with a 55% decrease, which would mean doubling the number of vehicles and would give us a scenario, just, just for thinking, no? of uh, having to register 60,000 zero emission vehicles with probably an operational fleet already um, on the roads of 300,000 vehicles that are zero emission vehicles, of which 60,000 would be hydrogen powered vehicles. Just some numbers to discuss and get, get things going, no? And um, th this is has required, I believe, all makers to change the way they work. All makers and all system suppliers, OEMs, everybody, all tier one suppliers, to change the way we were doing things, okay? To be disrupted by this new reality. As Civeco, we chose to partner up with Nikola Corporation because we believe they were the, the, they were the disruptive agent we needed for this transformation. And we started a journey with them two years ago to develop a zero emissions platform, both for US and for Europe with production sites, both in US and in Germany. And um, that would enable us to have available battery electrical vehicles and fuel cell electrical vehicles, okay? As just some characteristics of the fuel cell vehicle that we've developed and are now testing, it's a 200 kilowatt fuel cell stack with about 70 kilos of hydrogen on board, compressed at 700 bar, that would give us 800 kilometer range, up to 800 kilometer range, we could say, okay, for a long haul mission, okay? Very far from what you could do with a battery electrical vehicle, still very far from what you could do with a diesel vehicle, okay? And this spirit of partnership and our partnership with Nikola does not only extend product development, but also business development and also infrastructure development, investing into the creation of charging points of transport infrastructure of hydrogen and green hydrogen generation equipment. It's, it's, it's a big spirit behind what we believe has to be, will be the only way we can solve this emissions problem, the climatic uh, problem we have that we need to solve in one generation uh, in a sustainable way. And uh, in, in the trucking industry, I'm sure in many other industries, we speak about these three letters all the time, TCO, total cost of ownership, no? Because it's a good way to account for every single factor that impacts the financials of our customers, no? And if, if you believe that a truck can be bought by for 80, 90,000 euros, depends on the truck, depends on the make, but it's a good estimate. Owning the truck for five years would cost you almost 10 times as much, okay? Almost a million, 800,000 euros. And an important part of that is fuel, and an important that of this is part of that is driver salaries, and a very important part of that is financing, how you finance the truck, and new financing models have been coming into play in the last years, and most trucks now are leased. They're not sold as such. They're not sold for cash. They are leased on a monthly basis, including a maintenance and repair contract for five years. And this is, in the end, becoming a game where the customer must still make money on top of this monthly spending that they have due to the TCO of the truck. And hydrogen trucks will have to come to a TCO parity with diesel trucks. It has to happen. It's just not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna take us years to get there. 
Best estimates, 2030. Maybe optimistic, maybe not, we'll see. But the answer is that if we don't get there, it won't happen because we cannot change everything just changing the tractor unit of the truck. The rest of the logistic chain, life cycle of the truck, the world around it, it all has to change. And we all have to work in a coordinated way. And that means clearly number one, no? and this one is on us and on suppliers like Bosch, is a faster development of the technologies so that we can reach a level of maturity that is similar to a diesel vehicle today. A level of maturity we've needed almost 100 years to reach. And now we have to reach it in five, 10 at most. But we need to have fuel cell stacks that will live through 20,000 hours with a 60% efficiency, for instance, 30,000 hours. So we can get close to those 10 years in operation, right? So that we can have a reasonable resale value, or we will need a solution to swap cells and batteries second life. No, but that's clear and that's happening. And the track must be rebuilt in a way that aerodynamics are improved, that packaging happens around the fuel cell. So it will become a different product than it is today. Again, happening. We need to speed up the generation of green hydrogen at a reasonable cost, half of the cost that we see today. This is a very good preliminary estimate. We need a parallel development of the infrastructure, especially around, along what are called the, trans the trans-European corridors. Now, most of the transportation, of the long haul transportation in Europe happens along nine corridors, the TNT corridors that, um, for instance, the Scandinavian Mediterranean corridor from Sicily to Norway, it holds about 12,000 truck movements per day. Hydrogen stations should be placed every 200 kilometers in such a corridor to allow for the number of trucks that we were discussing before those 60,000. If 3,000 of those 60,000 were to run along this corridor, we would need around 300 stations. Now, estimates today say that we need to move in numbers of around 300 stations by 2025, 1,000 stations by 2030, if we want to be able to fuel the trucks that we want to deploy to reach the CO2 target, only for hydrogen. No? And then an important mindset change is gonna have to happen from in terms of policymakers must help, but we all need to change the way we think about these trucks. No? Just again, going back to the leasing model or the acquisition price or the buyback price of a truck, we'll have to change to account for the delta that we are introducing by now, starting with a new technology that will take years to get to where we are today with diesel. And uh, if we help this transition and everybody pushes, we'll get there. And then it is this coordinated effort that we are gonna be required to do if we wanna meet the climate target of CO2 parity by 2050. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Pablo. That was fantastic. Hugely interesting. And if you are watching virtually, do um, share your thoughts and comments in the chat um, about Pablo's speech and all, all of the things that you're seeing today. So um, I'm delighted next to introduce John Hunt from Toyota. John is here physically. So come on up, John. I look forward to hearing from your presentation. Great. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks very much for you, everyone who's staying around. And thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, it's really quite uh, pertinent, of course, that we're in a situation where people are discussing about getting to net zero or even zero, but really setting a target and a limit to what you go isn't good enough. You need to go beyond zero. You need to look at it holistically. You need to understand the wider implications. And as many of the speakers that have been talking today have been describing, and I'm just having a little bit of a technical issue to turn the slide over. I don't know whether... Anyone can help? Oh, just good. Thank you very much. So as has been said so, uh, so often today, I think, there's not one solution. And I certainly wouldn't be standing here today to tell you that there is either. Um, we've all got certain things we have to do. Everybody has and every business has different types of um, stresses and strains and tensions into what they can achieve. And we might have a, a similar journey that you need to go down, but you need different ways to address it. So there is no single solution to the problem of transport decarbonisation or energy decarbonisation. And I think we need to recognise that the carbon is the enemy in this case, and we need to embrace 
all those that are around. As an automobile manufacturer, of course, we have a wider consideration perhaps than others as well because it's our production plants that use raw materials. It's the vehicles themselves that use resources in life. It's indeed the whole process of recycling and reuse that has an impact. So we need to consider these in a wider perspective uh, as a business, which is why over the whole life of the business at Toyota, we've been considering sustainability. But in 2015, probably the most significant and, and full-ranging um, uh, plan was launched. And that really was to take a, a full view of the operation and not just to achieve um, zero and sustainability, but to go beyond that and see where we as a business could have a net positive impact in what we do and with the products that we, uh, that we sell. When it comes to transport, it's pretty clear. If you want zero tailpipe emissions, uh, electrification is going to have the biggest, biggest contribution. And there's a lot of pressures to achieve that as well, not least of which is uh, uh, legislation. But now, in reality, it's uh, uh, people's conscience and, and uh, realisation of the impact that it has. But it has to also apply, of course, across all transport needs. And transport has some particular concerns when people want to address uh, issues. From a manufacturing perspective, we've got to consider things that will impact the whole supply chain. We need to have products that have global applications so that they can be priced and accessible for people in different regions of the world and satisfy different needs. We have to consider the circular economy in relation to the material input. Once you produce something, you want to be able to reuse it and make best use of that value. You want to be able to recycle it easy. You want to incorporate it in different ways. So the circular economy is key to being able to achieve sustainability. And when you're using your products and you're producing your products, the use of renewable energy is essential for sustainability. And that energy quite often needs to be available on demand. So you have to be able to store it. And if it's renewable energy coming from an intermittent, that's extremely tough to achieve. From a consumer point of view, whether you're an individual or whether you're a business, you need it to be able to work financially as well as practically. So you need to be able to ensure that it doesn't cause disruption to your operation. You can't have a bus that can't make it uh, on its journey uh, or a load that can't be carried on a truck. And you can't have a vehicle that you can't afford to operate or a customer can't afford to buy a ticket for. So these are massive considerations when you're looking at the transport sector. And from a business perspective, Toyota has been considering this for, again, uh, its whole life. And through these years, this roadmap sustainable mobility has developed. The biggest development is that every one of the products that you see here displayed are available or in development, including the Lunar Rover, the hydrogen Lunar Rover, are in development with, with Toyota. And it's really important to understand that this reflects the fact that you have different requirements in different areas. So of course for heavy duty where individual products with fuel cells can achieve the lowest per unit reduction in emissions, that will work very well with fuel cell. In fact, battery electrification will be extraordinarily difficult to achieve. There's a sector which is going to require a transition where you're going to have plug-in and hybrid vehicles operating, which have an enormous benefit in their use. And then the smaller, lighter uh, vehicles or the lower duty cycle vehicles where you have access to, a, to direct electrical power uh, consistently, of course, battery electric could work extremely well. But why hydrogen? Why is the focus for the business specifically in terms of hydrogen? What we see here is a beautiful new second generation Mirai, the second generation dedicated fuel cell vehicle launched by Toyota. And we've heard a couple of comments today from individuals with personal opinions or, uh, or, or gathered opinions about certain sectors and things like this. But it's important to understand, you know, Toyota is a commercial business, of course, and it studies things. And when it decides that there's a potential to develop it, it sets up a business unit to do that. And that business unit was set up almost 30 years ago, longer than my colleague who was talking earlier on um, uh, about uh, the woes of hydrogen has actually been working in industry. So this is a considered opinion from a business that knows mobility. And for those 29 years, we've gone through a number of generations of products to be able to de develop a vehicle which we feel is suitable for the job it needs to achieve. And that was the launch of the Mirai in 2015, the world's first dedicated hydrogen fuel cell vehicle for mass production. And since that period, in just five years, we launched the second generation Mirai. 
That second generation Mirai carries all the benefits of the first generation in terms of uh, zero harmful emissions, the only emission being water. It's a quick to refuel vehicle, but it also has great utility as well. And in that combination of factors, we've been able to, in the second generation, uh, add additional improvements in terms of efficiencies and material use. More specifically, if you look at the first generation vehicle, we developed a linear platform where the fuel cell was sitting under the uh, front seats of the car, where the, the electric motor was at the front of the car, the fuel tanks behind, suitable for certain applications. And that had, at the time, the highest specific output of a fuel, sack of any, uh, fuel cell system of any time, 114 kilowatts out of just uh, a three and a half liter per kilowatt uh, uh, output, uh, size. But five years, in just five years, we've improved that efficiency enormously into the second generation. And in the second generation, we demonstrated a different way to implement the fuel cell systems by packaging it into the front of the vehicle in a modular unit and allowing the electric motor, indeed, in this case, to be in the rear. So it's a rear wheel drive car using tanks that then are dispersed across the vehicle. But with that development has come an enormous amount of efficiency. We've reduced the platinum loading in that system by 58% in just one generation, but increase the output to 5.4 kilowatts per litre, another world's highest output for a system, but improve the manufacturing process. So instead of taking 15 minutes even to produce a single cell in a fuel stack, of which there were 370, these systems now can be produced in seconds and they're reduced to just 330. A smaller, more powerful stack with less input has reduced the cost and will improve accessibility uh, for, uh, for the product and for the technology into other industries. Talking about range, well, it can normally do, I, have to, I can vouch for around 400 miles, but uh, just uh, a few weeks ago in the States, a world record, a Guinness world record for the distance traveled on, on hydrogen in a, in a vehicle, and I'm sure that will be exceeded. So taking today's figures about efficiencies or performance are wrong in terms of consideration for the future, and we'll see great advances for, fu for, for the future. An interesting uh, little uh, factor is, of course, very operation of fuel cells, as they clean the air as they, as they drive, the physical process that happens. But in addition, the next generation, this generation fuel cell car, has a, an air filter system in it using both a chemical filter and using a, a, a physical filter, removes particulates from the air, removes um, NOx and sulfur dioxide as it, as it travels. But the big question is about resources. And I'll put it to you, if you've got a set a finite amount of resources, a given amount of resources you're dragging out of the ground, what's the best thing to do with it? Well, my view is the best thing to do with it is to spread it as far and wide as you can. So I can take a set amount of material out of the ground and I have a decision to make. I can make one battery electric vehicle battery, a large battery, which will perfectly satisfy my needs for zero emission operation. Or I can make 30 or more fuel cell vehicle batteries. So the result of that is I can make 30 or more fuel cell vehicles for the same material input, the difficult to access, difficult to process, expensive and often polluting process of producing batteries, I can make 30 vehicles versus a single vehicle. The other consideration, of course, is the power. Because when I need to fuel something, whatever it is, I need that energy available on demand. My electricity coming from renewable powers is, power is not going to be available if I'm recharging uh, at night from solar or from wind when the wind doesn't blow. So I need a store of energy. And that store of energy, frankly, being hydrogen allows you to process renewable energy and deliver it on demand. And you can use it in a fuel cell car. Now, of course, fuel cell vehicles need fuel cells. So that's a difference from a battery vehicle. But a fuel cell is almost 100% recoverable and recyclable. The material that goes in can be recycled and reused for the same job over and over and over again. Notwithstanding the fact that a fuel cell barely degrades in the operation and indeed, whilst it will reduce some, a little bit in performance, it means that stack can keep operating for, for a very, very long time, unlike, unfortunately, the process of, of, uh, of battery operation. 
The other factor which is quite interesting that's brought up is about efficiency. We talk about efficiency in certain ways, and there are different ways to look at efficiency. Uh, using your time is a, uh, is, a, is a factor. But when you look at vehicles, it's weight that is the key factor of efficiency, not the way that you use your electricity. So if you take a fuel cell vehicle with a fuel cell, its tanks, its battery, its gas, in the Mirai, it weighs around about 190 kilos. For an equivalent battery electric vehicle, which won't do the same sort of range of performance, but it is a good benchmark, it's going to be 500, 550, maybe 600 kilos of weight that you have. That's a massive difference. But consider this. If I want to go twice the range, or I want to haul twice the load, if I, need a, I will need double the amount of battery to do that job with its consequence weight and its material inputs, compared to the fact that in a fuel cell vehicle, I just need a bit more hydrogen and some more tank space just as we have today in current vehicles. And it'll take a few minutes to refuel as opposed to a large battery, which could take hours and actually will degrade the system as you use it. You know, this vehicle here is the Catano fuel cell bus. This Catano, uh, Toyota Catano fuel cell bus, I should add, um, has exactly the same fuel cell system in it as the Mirai next to it, exactly the same. So it's multiple use allows for much better efficiencies across the supply chain. In fact, we have a range of products which have the same fuel cell systems in them or derivatives of them, from stationary power through to heavy duty transport. Just a couple of months ago, the Eiffel Tower using this Mirai's fuel cell system in a stationary generator was lit and, and various electrical operations were taken, demonstrating that this is a mobile and uh, interchangeable solution. And for Toyota, at the moment, we're constructing a city in Japan which will be run entirely on hydrogen, an incubation center, an innovation center which will develop this process even further. So thinking about it in sort of a single context is completely wrong. And often the critics will select different things and they will, of course, come up with reasons why things won't work. But often they'll never give you a solution or a, a way to make things work. And for Toyota, it's about mobility for all. So it's not one thing or the other, it's about embracing it all. And whether that's somebody who cannot move themselves around, or whether it's public transport to take many people around, or individual transport, our job is to make sure that this is achieved sustainably. And we believe that hydrogen will be key to enabling that to happen. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. That was hugely interesting, much appreciated. So we're going to carry on because we're quite pressed for time. We've had some great conversations, but it's important that we try and stick to time as best as we can. So I'm going to next move on to the next section where we've got three more keynote speeches. And I'm delighted to introduce our moderator host, who is Celia Graves from HFCA. So welcome, Celia. And I'll hand over to Celia um, for the next session. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, so, as has just been said, I'm Celia Greaves from the UK Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association. We're the largest and longest running trade body in the space. And if you'd like to know more, please visit our website or come and talk to us upstairs on our stand. Uh, very pleased to be moderating this session. And we're going to start, first of all, with Nico Sargent from River Simple. So, Nico, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'm Nico Sargent from River Simple. Um, it's a small company based in mid Wales and we are designing and making um, hydrogen cars. So I'm here to tell you a bit about what we're doing, why we're doing it and why we think hydrogen makes also sense for personal transport. Um, so our aim is mobility at zero cost to the planet. And our purpose is to pursue systematically the elimination of environmental impact of personal transport. And we're talking about elimination, and that's a strong word, it's a strong statement. We know we're not going to get there overnight, but if we don't aim to eliminate, we will never get there. If we aim to just reduce emissions and be slightly less unsustainable, we'll still be unsustainable. So how do we go about this? Um, well, for personal transport, there's different technologies available. Um, so we literally looked at all the different things we could do, from biopetrol and diesel to hybrid cars, plug-in hybrids, battery electric, and hydrogen electric. And we looked at it in the context of well-to-will emissions. So from literally extracting the energy, 
converting it, transporting it, getting it into the car to the number of miles driven with that energy. Um, and we concluded that a very efficient hydrogen electric powertrain um, was the way to go. But usually to make decisions for technology or policies um, or business model, people use forecasting. So at a given point in time, you sort of think, well, what technology should we invest in? What, what is going to be the future? What's going to be uh, more profitable or more sustainable or more resilient? And then people tend to invest heavily into a particular type of technology and then see how it works. We use backcasting. Um, so um, starting from the end game, which is 100% zero emission transport. And from that point, we, walk our, we work our way back to where we are now to choose the right type of business model, um, technology, um, so we can, we can get to really 100% zero emission. And that's a way to not end up with less optimal solutions or dead ends or having to effectively write off a huge amount of investment uh, into technologies that might not get where we need to go. And that also applies for blue hydrogen. What we need is 100% zero emission transport, and that's 100% green hydrogen. Um, so we use what we call whole system design. Um, so that's optimizing the entire system, not just parts in isolation. And that stands for the car itself, but the business model as well. So I'll tell you briefly about uh, the business first and then the car. So in terms of business, we will not be selling cars. We will be selling mobility as a service, not cars as a product. If you think about conventional car manufacturers that sell cars, they need to sell more and more cars. They need you to need a new car every so many years, otherwise they run out of business. And that's effectively maximizing the, the use of energy, the use of materials, uh, which is not the best way to go about things. So we really need to move away from a linear economy to a fully circular economy. So we are now moving towards more of a recycling economy, but we need all those um, uh, technological uh, materials to stay in the loop effectively forever and not end up uh, in the bin. So what does it mean for us, sale of service? It means our customers will pay for mobility, they'll pay for the car to use uh, for themselves, so it'll be parked in their driveway, it'll feel like their own vehicle, uh, for as long as they want, several months, several years, and then the cars will come back to us so we can re-prepare it for a new customer. And that means that we keep, as a company, we keep on ownership of the cars throughout the entire life. It means we get revenue through the entire life of the car. Uh, it also means that we need to design the car in a different way. So uh, the monthly payment will include uh, all the costs, so the use of the vehicle, uh, as well as all the maintenance, the insurance, and the fuel. It means we have a direct business incentive to make the car as fuel efficient as possible, uh, as cheap as possible to maintain, and as long lasting as possible. So literally, we make more money if the cars are on the road for many more years than, than conventionally. Uh, and that's also important for fuel efficiency. So if you think about conventional cars, um, a 1948 Beetle was about 38 miles to the gallon, and a 2018 Beetle is roughly the same. And that's because fuel efficiency, uh, the, the benefit is to the driver, to the customer, not to the manufacturer. So we need to make efficiency profitable. So by including the fuel in the monthly bill, we literally uh, have a direct business incentive to make the car more fuel efficient. Um, so how do we go about this? So the car itself. Um, you can't break physics. So cars are big, heavy things. They need to go through the air, and that requires quite a lot of power. Um, also, cars have become bigger and bigger and heavier and heavier. So you end up needing, regardless of how it's powered, you, you end up needing a lot of power, a lot of energy to move a big lump uh, across the road to move people around. So what we need, regardless of the source of power, uh, we need more aerodynamic cars, we need lighter cars, and we need smaller cars. Um, and in terms of uh, powertrain, conventional cars have got just an engine, uh, a gearbox, and conventional brakes that just waste the energy uh, under braking. So engines are sized for acceleration, so big, powerful engines so the cars can get to your speed relatively quickly. But most of the time when you're cruising, you're not using much of that power. So most of the time your engine is redundant. You're transporting this big lump of metal um, for nothing. So we've come up with a so-called network electric powertrain with a combination of electric motors. We have four electric motors, one in each wheel, so they are literally wheel motors. Um, a small fuel cell, uh, which is an order of magnitude uh, less powerful than uh, in a Toyota Mirai, and a pack of supercapacitors that provide the power to accelerate and also get the energy back under braking. 
it makes the whole system extremely efficient uh, and the hydrogen fuel cell is only sized for constant cruising which actually doesn't use a lot of power. So we can use a smaller, cheaper fuel cell and have similar performance to a normal car. Um, so the result is the River Simple Raza. Um, so it uh, weighs only 650 kilos, which is not far off the weight of a, just a Tesla battery, just the battery, but that's the whole car. Uh, it takes five minutes to fuel up and it's got 500, uh, 300 mile range. Um, it's very aerodynamic uh, and it's optimized for longer life. Uh, under the skin, uh, we have, as I said, in-wheel motors, one in each wheel, um, a pack of supercapacitors, which are slightly different to batteries. Um, they can uh, effectively, they store electricity in a different way, um, and they can release a lot more power than a conventional battery. Uh, we have a composite structure, it's carbon fiber, um, hydrogen tank at the back at 350 bar, and an off-the-shelf uh, PEM fuel cell. So, battery versus hydrogen. Uh, we think it's the wrong question. We basically need both of them, and the question is not really to do with the size of the vehicle, but the utilization, the use case. So it's not necessarily big heavy lorries need hydrogen, small cars need battery. It's really to do with how many miles they need to run, where they can be refueled or, or plugged in. Um, and for some, some small markets like uh, forklifts, it does make sense economically uh, to run hydrogen fuel cell forklifts instead of battery forklifts. So it's a very interesting system where we need both technologies. Um, in terms of refueling infrastructure, um, the car we've designed, we call it a local car, so it's only a two-seater, and we expect people to use it to go to the shops and back, to work and back, not long family trips. Um, um, the, in terms of refueling, we can have a distributed refueling station instead of needing a full nationwide infrastructure. So we don't need to wait for the whole uh, country to have stations all across. We can have a, a few localized fueling stations, which create a commercial market for several dozens of cars to navigate around one, one fueling station. So most people, I drive a hybrid car, I always fuel it pretty much at the same petrol station. So we can create a market in a small area and then expand slowly by bringing more and more small refueling stations. Um, so we currently have one fueling station in Abergavenny, that's the one at the bottom right, uh, which is in Mid Wales, and then uh, we're part of a project in Milford Haven in Pembrokeshire, well, there's another fueling station with an electrolyzer uh, where we run a few cars for, uh, for testing. And in terms of uh, manufacturing, um, we want to create smaller uh, manufacturing plants, um, a local car locally, manufactures with, locally manufactured uh, with local jobs. So instead of big uh, plants making hundreds of thousands of cars, we're looking about uh, making a, a network of, of small manufacturing facilities with a capacity of 5,000 cars per annum. So we are currently building a batch of 20 cars. They are pre-production cars. Uh, they are running around. We have one outside, so please do, do come have a look. Another one is in uh, Glasgow at COP26. Um, and they are out and about uh, being tested. And the main message really is that uh, we're really ready to go and, and we need both. Batteries are not going to solve all the transport problems. We need both batteries and hydrogen in fuel cell. And we're really looking forward to see more and more hydrogen being used in personal transport. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nico. Great to hear about your design philosophy and, and um, the car looks absolutely fantastic. So um, next we are going to hear from Tiffany Mittelstenshine uh, from Bosch. So if I can welcome Tiffany to the floor. Thank you. Hello. Um, yeah, my name is Tiffany Mittelstenshine. Um, I'm a product manager at Robert Bosch in Germany and I'm responsible for our stacks. And I will talk about um, yeah, the fuel cell application in, in mobile transport and what we do here uh, for automotive powertrains. So we all heard a lot of um, the topic that we need to reduce the um, emissions. So this is common sense today. And also we see that the transport makes only a portion of it. But nevertheless, to achieve um, these targets of CO2 reduction, we need a significant share of electric vehicles. So depending if it's 15% reduction, 30% or even 55, um, we need to go for electrification. And 
When we look in the future, we expect in 2030 worldwide up to 3 million new registered um, vehicles which are powered by a fuel cell. So when we look on, on the passenger car side, we see it's maybe a smaller portion, but nevertheless, it's still quite a lot of number. And especially when it comes to commercial vehicles, then as in our progressive scenario, we see up to 15% um, which are running by a fuel cell. So, um, yeah, we see this will be definitely part of the future powertrain mix, and we need to develop it today. So, all the witnesses here um, at the event maybe already saw our exhibition in the entrance area. So, if you go home later, take the <laughs> chance um, to have a look. And to our audience, uh, in yeah, online audience, uh, you can go also to our uh, website or meet us at the next event. Um, we will be happy to show you our products. Um, so let's go to the different segments. Um, when we look on commercial vehicle first, we see that in Germany, for example, only 14% um, makes a fleet of heavy duty vehicles. But these 14% are responsible for two thirds of the CO2 emissions. That's, that's really a, a big number and um, also the reason why we start at this point to go for um, the electrification. And especially the long haul application has the um, highest impact on mileage and payload. So this is really the application where we should focus for electrification. And then the question is, okay, we go for electrification, but which solution should it be? Battery or fuel cell? So here again, and we heard it today quite a lot, it really depends on the mileage and the, the load you want to carry with your truck. So the larger the distances, the higher the payload is, um, the more favorable is the fuel cell um, powertrain. And you have, as you also already heard uh, today, the advantage of the fast refueling time. But what about the smaller vehicles? So like com light commercial vehicles. Here, it really depends on the use case. But you can keep in mind, again, the higher the range is and the higher the, the load you want to carry, the more favorable it is with a fuel cell. And again here, uh, we just saw it in, in the previous presentation, it's very, very nice. We scale the, the range in a fuel cell with the tank and not <coughs> with the battery. And the tank weight is much more or less than um, the battery um, for a battery electric vehicle. So the, the TCO on that case might be a little uncertain nowadays because it all depends on the fuel cell, system costs, uh, battery costs, but even more on cost of electricity and um, yeah, hydrogen. So, but still we have the point of heavy load and long distances where we go for the fuel cells. And the most um, discussed uh, topic are the passenger cars. So here I would say it's really funny sometimes because even in, in the hydrogen or fuel cell um, yeah, uh, group or economy, we agree to disagree. So it's really an individual decision how you evaluate the um, yeah, your use case factors. How often are you going for a long distance or um, do you have some charging opportunities at home or not? I make it personal. Oh, sorry, this was the microphone. Um, I'm, I'm a camper, we have a caravan and with, at the moment we have a diesel engine and we can travel 800 kilometers, which is around 500 miles with one refueling. So especially when you have such a big thing behind of your car, 
you don't want to go quite often to the refueling station and especially finding one is maybe also not so easy where you can get into with this uh, 12 meter uh, long vehicle um, setup. So here, when we go in, in our next, uh, let me call it car buying decision for an electric vehicle, we want to have the same range. And therefore, our target is um, yeah, to, to get it. And we see it here, especially with the fuel cells. Because again, as we, we saw it and heard it already today, the range is really scaled by the tank and not um, the battery load on this side. Yeah, but as you see on the slide, there are definitely also some, some other um, reasons. So the question is for each individual person how you evaluate these and um, it will be depending on what you decide on <coughs> that. So last, the question is how we bring it to scale. So for heavy commercial vehicles, it's very easy to understand and common sense, we start here. And this is also um, supported by the infrastructure. So the infrastructure you need for commercial vehicles is more predictable. You have distinctive roads, you know where the trucks are running, um, especially in, in the last um, presentations, we heard the example of Europe where we have the transnet really from the north to the south, from the west to the east, and this makes it possible. Um, it's very predictable on this side. And also the power density requirements are not so big or not so much as um, for um, the passenger cars. And so the evaluation will be from the biggest cars to the smaller ones. So next step are the light commercial vehicles. We already see the first demo um, applications um, on, on the roads. And next, maybe then the SUVs and pickups uh, where you, you need, for example, the towing capacity. And maybe, believe me or not, uh, Later, we also see the fuel cells in the other passenger car applications. And the point here is to bring the costs down. But how to bring the costs down would be the topic of another um, presentation. So this will I not cover today. Um, but it's really important to, to keep in mind we, we need to scale up in, in the numbers um, to get it down and yeah. Let's go for, for hydrogen for mobility. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tiffany. Some really nice statistics in your presentation, which I think we'll, we'll come back to in the subsequent discussion. So we have one more presentation in this session, and then we'll um, open the floor for some uh, discussion and, and questions. So um, lastly, I'd like to welcome up Ian Macbeth of Enterprise. Thank you, Ian. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, nice to see some people have stuck around. Um, must be the Prince Michael of Kent is a clear <laughs> attraction rather than myself. Um, just like to say thanks to Bosch for inviting us to speak today. Um, we work with Bosch on many different projects across, not just here in Europe, but also in North America and we buy quite a lot of their product as well. So it does pay to have this good relationship. So I'm EV Strategy Director for Enterprise in Europe. So that's our corporate operations in UK and Ireland, France, Germany and Spain, but I also have a dotted line with the rest of the EU 27 countries where we have a presence in all of those areas. So Enterprise, um, small family owned business, uh, well actually the largest rental company in the world, um, but we are still family owned and we've got a broad geographic footprint obviously across North America and Europe but also around the rest of the world as well. Here in the UK we've got around about 470 locations from Land's End to John O'Groat and we have around about 5,000 staff serving those areas. Many people will know Enterprise from renting a vehicle for their holidays uh, at an airport and that kind of thing. 
We're a little bit more diverse than that. Um, we work with a lot of the insurance companies in the UK for accident repair, replacement vehicles. So if you're unlucky enough to have bumped your vehicle, uh, chances are it's an enterprise vehicle that is your courtesy car. It's not branded as such, but it's likely to be that space. <coughs> we can rent you an exotic car if you want. Um, we have Car Club. But we also have uh, a large commercial vehicle uh, presence in the UK, roughly around about 50 to 60,000 vehicles at the moment, uh, covering from everything from golf buggies through to vans, through to HGV tractor units and the like. Now, the clear thing about this is that we buy a lot of cars and a lot of vehicles, and we tend to keep those vehicles for about six to nine months before moving on into the, into the uh, second-hand market. So we buy the latest technology, we buy it at scale, and we then deploy it into the wider marketplace, improving access accessibility and availability of new technologies to customer groups who perhaps couldn't afford that vehicle new. So that's kind of one of the reasons why we are quite interested in hydrogen because we are one of the people, one of the operators who can scale this business rapidly. So around about this time last year, uh, we started a piece of work with a company called Roland Berger. Some of you may be uh, familiar with them. They're a management consultancy uh, in Germany with an uh, international footprint. And we asked them a couple of questions. You know, what does electrification mean for uh, enterprise? What does that look like? What sort of technologies might it be? Is it right to call it electrification or decarbonisation? And also then to also understand, <coughs> did the legislators understand rental and what our specific requirements in decarbonisation means in terms of a broader uh, legislatural regulatory environment? So what we did, uh, we gave uh, Ronberg around about data for 30 million rental transactions across Europe in 2019, pre-COVID, and just asked them to look at every aspect of the business, whether that's vehicle acquisition, vehicle disposal, maintenance, financing, operational activities, all this kind of stuff. Probably the only part of the company that wasn't involved was HR. And as we've now put all of our uh, senior execs into EVs, HR are very much now involved as well. We also use this as a piece of outreach to go to both the UK government, the Department for Transport, OZEV, BAYS, Ofgem, and the European Commission uh, to look at some of the things that they were considering about the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive revisions. Quite important for us like that because we recognise there's a huge focus on EVs and powers in there, maybe less focus on hydrogen. So our submission really went into the EU and said we need to consider all technologies, we're technology neutral and not just to put all eggs in one basket. So that was very important for us to try and shape how legislation is, is moving forward in European perspective. So, what we've been doing is decoding the complexity of hydrogen operations for us. I mentioned we keep the vehicles for a relatively short period of time. 90% of our vehicles are out on rental at any one time with our customers. It doesn't mean they're all on the road, but they're generating revenue. And one in four of those vehicles is turned around in an hour, within an hour between customers. An airport operation, it can be as short as 20 minutes. And that's cleaning the vehicle, getting refueled, and ready for the next customer. And clearly there are different challenges around that with the different technologies. So short turnaround times means short refueling periods. So you can begin to see why hydrogen may be of interest for us. Infrastructure. We're getting quite a lot of experience at the moment with the EV infrastructure, with battery electric vehicles, uh, that it's overnight charging. But for our customers in particular, the access to rapid charging for an EV is quite important. Now, most of you will be used to the experience of going to a petrol forecourt, fueling your vehicle with a credit card in five minutes. How do you replicate that with new technologies? And again, this is one of the areas where hydrogen potentially has an interest for us because of the short turnaround times that our customers demand. You don't rent a vehicle to spend hours either on a charge or in a refueling situation. Time is money. So what we're kind of suggesting now going forward is that rental is a low risk environment for organizations or corporate clients to actually trial new technologies. And that could be battery electric, but it can also be hydrogen. And so we've gone through the adoption curve with the EVs. We, we know what the challenges of EVs are. And the reality is that the hydrogen 
uh, pathway is very, very similar. It's a familiarity of the customers with the, with the technology. How do you refuel it? Uh, cost of fuel, where is the infrastructure? It's a very, very similar sort of uh, pathway uh, to marketplace. But for us, it really is about the customer. You know, customer is king. We are a customer-led organization. If our customers don't have a good experience, they're not going to come back and rent it from us. So we're going to have to ask a few questions, questions to our customers going forward. What's the vehicle going to be used for? Um, where are you taking it, perhaps? What sort of distance you're expecting to travel? And to just help educate the customer along that way. But it is really about fungibility of assets. We've got to have the right vehicle in the right place at the right time for the right customer. So that's absolutely critical for us. I just want to sort of maybe just finish just a little bit about hydrogen and sh shared mobility. Uh, we've got one of our car club vehicles on display downstairs. Um, we're the only operator in the UK to offer 24-7, 365 days a year access through our car club. You can book it on an app. You just swipe your credit card on the windscreen, tap in the uh, pin code, and away you go. And that's backed up sort of you can rent that by the hour, but if you want to take it for longer, we get discounted rates on a rental proposition as well. And what we're finding increasingly, particularly from our government and local government uh, clients, is really a sort of switch to about how can you decarbonize mobility. So we're working on a bunch of mobility hubs with different authorities in the UK. One of the key things that comes up, time, is in, and this is increasingly important, I was struck by some of the conversations about different flavors of hydrogen. We're being asked about environmental sustainability and governance. Uh, as part of when we're tendering for contracts. And we're seeing a lot of the supply chain having the same conversations now. So whereas at the moment where people are asking us how many EVs we've got, what we expect to see in the future is what flavour of hydrogen have you got? What is the environmental credentials between that hydrogen? So it's just something that we're seeing in a broader ESG thing that might be useful for people in this room to think about. And then mobility as a service. Uh, Hugo mentioned it. Um, it's something that everybody's looking into at the moment. We've actually got vehicles out in, in Inverness and Aberdeen, north, northeast Scotland at the moment, very rural area, where we've actually integrated car club, car rental into a, an app that also shows rail, funny enough, the lines up there are not electrified, so proposition for hydrogen rail. We've also incorporated short distance, short haul flights, because that's what you do to get to the islands of north Scotland. And again, zero, uh, zero carbonized or decarbonizing aviation, again, another hydrogen space. So we can see all these technologies coming together to complement each other and create that wider market. It's not just about automotive, it's more about mobility, but then you can bring in other factors, such as, as heating and all those kind of things that we've heard about. We've had one of the vehicles here at Imperial over the last four or five months, um, you've been able to trial out. Um, so, you know, we're going to be doing quite a, li a lot more of this in the future. You can see a picture of our, some of our fleet of Mirais down in the corner there. And then, just to finish off, just really pleased that we've just extended our Mirai program with Toyota for another year. So, thank you, John, um, for, the, for helping on that. We're going to be looking at more technology demonstrations over the next year. So, please do get in contact if you want to try a Mirai. And we're also very interested in the opportunities for commercial vehicles for all the reasons that Bosch mentioned about duty cycles and range and refueling times. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you like to uh, join the team? Lovely and uh, particularly nice to hear a, a user perspective. So thank you. OK, so we've got about 15 minutes now for discussion and questions. Um, I'm going to take uh, Chair's prerogative, if that's all right, a quick question for me to start with. Um, when we look at what's happening in terms of, of the rollout of hydrogen, whether it's for passenger cars or um, other modes, what do you think the UK can learn from overseas? Are there some good examples of good practice, whether it's from a policy perspective or deployment perspective, that you've seen in other um, locations that we can learn from? Do you want to start, yeah. Tiffany? OK. <laughs> um, I think what, what we see now that a lot of countries are going for hydrogen roadmaps. And this is what we already heard today also. We need to think the complete ecosystem. It's not only the car. We also need the infrastructure. We need the users who want to, to use it. And um, we need test, um, how you call it, um, areas. And then you show 
it is working, then you can get familiar with the technology and um, this is really important. And at the moment, as it is with every new technology, the costs are higher than when we compare it now with the diesel engine, which is already over 100 years old. So there's really a lot of experience and history and knowledge inside. And the fuel cell technology is, is more in, in, in the beginning, even um, when we see now um, the first um, applications also really running on, on the streets and all those things. Um, but the subsidy programs are very helpful on, on this side to, to get the small projects um, yeah, visible. Yeah. There's a bigger rollout of hydrogen uh, infrastructure in, in France and Germany and Japan as well. And so it seems like in the UK there's more uh, funding going towards specifically battery electric and not necessarily more wider to different technologies. And um, as we said, the, the, one of the biggest problems with, with fuel cell is still the cost of manufacture because the volumes are so low. Uh, so having more investment and more rollout of the, in, of the infrastructure will bring more vehicles and will bring the, co the cost of the whole uh, ecosystem down. Absolutely. Ian? Yeah, I mean, we've been following with interest sort of the hydrogen strategies that have been published by Spain, and Germany and France in particular, and of course at the EU level. Uh, UK is getting there. It's a little bit slower than some of the other areas perhaps. Um, but, the, but the key thing is if you look at the infrastructure in Germany, for instance, there's well over 100 hydrogen refueling stations. So the, the actual proposition is easier already in Germany. What we need to be doing is investing in that strategic uh, infrastructure. I think you know we have to shout, shout out ITM and others who've you know blazed the trail, um, but we need more funding for that infrastructure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, questions from the floor. We've now got an opportunity. Got a question actually from YouTube. It's from Paul. Pereira, Paul, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. He says, do we see liquid hydrogen in long-haul transport? Do we see that as the solution, given that there is a load economics and it makes sense to reduce the volume slash weight of hydrogen tanks? So essentially, do we see hydrogen really being the solution for long-haul transport? And what, what are you, what's the panel's thoughts on that? To me, there's several things. It's either the transport of hydrogen uh, from the where it's being created to the use or, or on, on vehicles. So um, uh, I think we should really have localized production of hydrogen uh, still as a compressed gas so we don't transport huge amounts of hydrogen, either liquefied or through ammonia or the systems. So we should have localized production, localized, localized use and storage for, uh, for, for renewables. Now, on vehicle, um, uh, using liquid hydrogen requires quite a lot of energy, requires specialized tanks, requires cryogenic temperatures, so it's, it's very complex. So I think we'll still have um, uh, high pressure compressed hydrogen for onboard vehicles. Um, and then we could have liquefied hydrogen or ammonia for long transport, but ideally we wouldn't have long transport of, of hydrogen across continents. Yeah, I would say we start definitely with the, with the gas compressed um, tanks. And maybe later we will also see some liquid hydrogen tanks uh, on, on board. So we, we realize it when we talk to our customers about the topic. So from, from a Bosch perspective, we are open for, for both um, opportunities. So our uh, products, for example, the fuel cell system, uh, the fuel cell power module we, we exhibit in the entrance, um, very simple set, doesn't care if it's liquid or, or, um, or com gas com compressed. compressed, thank you. Um, and our um, tank wells we, we have um, also in our portfolio, um, they work also for both. So we need to be open, we need to be, have standards which, which work with both. And when, when it comes to the energy capacity, um, the liquid, Hydrogen definitely has some advantages, but as you already said, it comes not on no cost. So you need to do then other things. And again, here you need to look for the complete system and the infrastructure is again a second one then. Yeah. Anything to add, Ian? Well, I'm not an engineer, um, but it did say that we're technology agnostic. Um, 
One thing I would observe, though, is that access to power is, is a key part of the decarbonisation for transport, and the cost of providing power can be prohibitive, particularly if you're talking about long-distance cable upgrades and things like that. So I do feel that hydrogen you know, could play quite a big part in areas where it's expensive to electrify, maybe in more rural areas. But you also have to look at the conventional forecourts of today, very site constrained and not all of them have power. So I do see the facility even for hydrogen to be in those inner city areas as well as a sort of long distance trunking routes and those kind of things we've seen. Um, I think the main thing about batteries is the weight and, and John made a very good point about the light weighting and the RASA is a very good example. That different design for philosophy, designing out weight mm -hmm. um, to make the vehicles more efficient. Yeah. Absolutely. And there, is, there are trials of um, uh, liquefied hydrogen being undertaken in the UK, so uh, things are, watch this space. Um, more questions either from the floor or remotely? Nope. Okay. <laughs> I have a couple more. So um, we've, we've talked about things like the need for a whole system approach. We've talked about the, um, the need to develop infrastructure in parallel. Um, the need for investment, other barriers that we need to overcome to, to get this scaled up? Um, I think it's not very, it's not technological barriers. Most of that has been effectively solved. Uh, it's more to do with people and policies and politics. So in investment in the right type of things and, and scale, as we said. So um, unlike uh, batteries are, you know, manufacturing process of batteries have been optimized, uh, uh, you know, so big manufacturing gigafactories are all fully automated. So the price is really in the raw material, which will go up when there's less and less of it. When fuel cell costs will go down because at the moment we're not up to scale. So, so it's really down to scaling is all up. Yeah. Ian? Exactly the same thing, really. Um, <laughs> Get the cost out. Exactly. It's, it's driving the cost out, but it's also just support to get it pushed through more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've been talking about it for a long time, um, the time now is for action. And I, I do think that some of the benefits here in the UK about our manufacturing base and those job creation and so on is going to be a huge part of it. We do have to look at our energy mix. You know, do we really want to put all our eggs in one basket? Um, and I do think the renewables area is going to be very important for the generation of hydrogen. So we really do need to encourage that. I live down in Kent, very close to where the interconnector comes in from France. It went up in smoke recently. That was maybe 5 to 10% of the UK's energy uh, knocked out. So we do have to be sort of thinking about that energy sufficiency side of things mm -hmm. as well. Okay, thank you. Tiffany? Yeah, I can just add, um, this is also one of the reasons why we decided to go for, for the fuel cell um, production, because we see... Uh, our our competence in, in this industrialization is, is really necessary because we, we have a lot of uh, fuel cell examples and um, also Toyota we heard today with, with really a long experience but we need to go um, as automotive suppliers with, with a long history also in that direction we know how to industrialize uh, topics and to bring the costs down and this we now need to transfer from, from the yeah, internal combustion engine technology to the new topics like fuel cell. Mm -hmm. okay. I think there's some really interesting developments in terms of the supply chain opportunities. We've seen that reflected in a lot of our new members and people we've been talking to today. Companies have got history in, say, oil and gas um, in different parts of the supply chain, really looking at hydrogen and fuel cells now as, a, as an area for them to grow new business and apply their existing technology and expertise. So it would be fantastic if we can you know, use these homegrown solutions to, to support the, these technologies as we move forward. Um, OK, last chance for questions from the floor. Dennis. And this is uh, essentially it's for, uh, for enterprise. Uh, you were looking at using the survey work that you did in order to gain understanding of what the, your users were doing, and you were looking at then taking some of that for policy recommendation or change or framework for uh, discussion with 
government departments in Europe and in the UK. What was the outcome of that? Did you have a firm set of, okay, we've seen what is happening, we've seen the relative pace of uh, maybe uh, users looking for decarbonizing uh, vehicle operations, does that mean that you've put policy change or recommendation to government? Uh, and then also, does that apply to different classes of vehicles and users that you have seen in Europe and UK and so on? So is there commonality, is there differentiation, and, and, or is there a common set of themes that you would say, yeah, this is what uh, our customers are looking for, and therefore we are looking also for the policy change to achieve it? So from a policy perspective, uh, and having come from a transport planning background, there's a hierarchy of transport, um, typically with active travel at the top, public transport, and then the car. And the car is generally sort of just placed as one layer at the bottom of the cake. It gets very little policy attention. So there are multiple different operational characteristics of people who operate vehicle fleets. Uh, and a lot of what has been proposed has come from the lease cows or logistics fleets. So when we've gone to talk to policymakers about the rental industry, they have no idea about the turnaround times, the utilization rates of our fleet and the scale of our fleet. You know, we've got two million vehicles globally. We're the largest private buyer of vehicles in the world. And yet our perspective has been left out of that policy. So that has led to multiple meetings with different uh, departments. So you're talking about DG Move, DG Energy, DG Climate, people like that, but also here in the UK, their equivalents. And that has inevitably led to multiple follow-up meetings to understand about the industry. So it's not just about enterprise, it's the industry as a whole. Um, and that's been quite eye-opening because I don't think the policymakers had thought about that aspect of our customer base. And I make the point again, you don't rent a car to sit charging it or filling it for hours on end. Um, and also a lot of the people who use our services don't have access to charging at home for, for EVs and so on. So that's been a really important part and I think that's reinforced people have actually gone back and thinking, okay, we need to think about this in more detail. And then the second side of it is, yeah, you know, what our different customer base looks like and so on. And again, a lot of policymakers just assume that we provide a rental car for people going on holiday at an airport. It's a much broader uh, proposition than that. So I think what we've been able to do using that study is just sort of just raise awareness of the scale of our industry and the importance of our industry, but how quickly we can scale the technology and bring it to market and help deliver those decarbonisation strategies. Thank, thank you, Ian. Okay, um, I'm going to bring this session to a close now. So before I hand back to Helen for some uh, summary comments, um, I'd just like to thank all our uh, speakers in this section. Thank you very much.